So I'm the founder and CEO of Immersive Rehab. And uh, basically what we work on is we develop um, new therapies in virtual reality to help people with neurological conditions. Uh, we cover in a more efficient manner from an upper limb perspective, balance perspective, and we also add cognitive challenges to our programs. Um, but the main focus is still improving um, mobility of people with neurological conditions uh, using digital um, tools and using virtual reality. Um, yeah, I mean, since we're, I just wanted to ask you uh, and, and the attendees basically to just do some afternoon movement or whatever you are in the day. <laughs> Uh, in the world, can be morning or, or later in the evening, is to put up your thumb and, and then just move it like this. It's very easy. And then close your eyes and move it again. Very easy again. Uh, and I just want to, to have you keep that image in mind as we go through the talk. Um, as, as we are all very healthy, we're able to do that in a very simple manner. But uh, for a lot of people, that's not the case. So anymore. Um, so I mean, the reason why I started immersive rehab initially is is uh, ten years ago I had a severe work accident. So I went through um, a lot. This is me six months apart essentially. So um, I went through a long uh, rehab period myself to get back to. Uh, I had a head injury, neck injury, and severe vertigo issues, um, meaning that I had very few balance for a long time. So I went through a long rehab period myself to get back to how I, how I am today and, and more mobile. And I, I just went through all the frustrations that come with it. If you've ever been to rehab, essentially, the exercise that you often get, you really don't see the points of doing them, even though you're very motivated, but you don't get any feedback, really. You don't really see how you're progressing. Um, they're often very boring and repetitive. Um, and if you've gone through a severe accident or any, I mean, any small injury as well, if you've gone through rehab, you most likely have experienced the, fa the fact of the boring exercises or um, not really being motivated to, to do them um, uh, because you don't really see, kind of get any feedback from that. And so, so I started to look into ha having that experience myself into, are there ways to change the, the engagement that people have with um, rehabilitation? Um, are there ways that we can actually improve compliance because of that as well? I, I'm a so I'm a biomedical engineer myself, and um, I I just want, want to see is there a way that we can actually help people increase their adherence to rehab where today it's very bad essentially. So in most rehabilitation, physical neuro rehabilitation, adherence is is really low, and especially um, for upper limb rehabilitation, it's 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 worse. So often because it's more frustrating to go to, to the tools are very limited that therapists or neurologists have at their disposal. Um, and if you can't use your hands, it is extremely uh, frustrating and hence people just tune out more frequently, um, leaving them with uh, often severe disabilities still when they are discharged from the hospital and beyond. Um, so, um, so essentially I started looking into different conditions um, aside from spinal injury, uh, also started looking into MS and stroke. And uh, yeah, uh, sadly, the problem um, of MS and stroke are um, uh, and spinal injury that they're they're only increasing um, year by year. And um, if you look at MS, for example, the average age of MS is about thirty years old, um, of which three to one women versus men, which means that. A lot of people, or most people that are diagnosed with MS, they are very active. They have a very active life, whether it's professionally or personally. Uh, and, and so having a diagnosis of MS at, at such a young age, where then you know that you don't know how, how fast your disease obviously will progress, um, but at some point your mobility will be affected. And, and that's really what we're trying to tackle is that give people more independence back essentially to avoid people from getting into a situation with severe disability, physical disability at some point to actually end up with severe depression and worse. 
Um, and because of the conditions, obviously, cognitive and physical disability goes together. So um, similar for stroke. So there's about 17 million strokes every year worldwide. And more than 50% of those people that survive a stroke, they, they have a remaining disability. So essentially, that means that they would need to have a continuous rehab to be able to progress and they can still progress. But the problem is access to rehab is very low in a lot of cases. So you might have direct access in the hospital when you're diagnosed with a stroke and when, you, when you're in the hospital in the acute setting. But then when you leave the hospital after some weeks, essentially you're, and you're often um, left with another gap of a long waiting time or no access to rehab because where you live, there might not be any really, um, community center or hospital or um, facility for you because you live in a more remote area, for example. So, um, so and, and obviously because of the fact that more and more people are, um, are affected by stroke as well, but the, the amount of professionals actually is not increasing at the same rate. So there's not enough professional staff either to actually cope with, with um, helping um, people on, on a, on the basis, or the timely basis that they should be able to get help, um, but rather we end up with a very long waiting time um, to access, for example, outpatient care um, and, and community settling care. Um, so, um, yeah. and COVID-19 obviously has brought a lot of um, additional issues for, for those patients because obviously in a lot of, when the first wave hit, most of our clinical partners that we work with as well, they, they had to, they, had, they, they completely closed down their centers essentially. So they, um, they were only offering potentially some inpatient um, acute care, uh, which was also very limited because of what they could do, because the patients could not leave their hospital rooms, for example, uh, because of the risk of getting infected as well, on top of having just being diagnosed with a stroke. So, um, so that's, that's, uh, that, that was very problematic. Then most other centers, a lot of other centers completely closed down. And the fact that they didn't have any virtual care in place um, in a lot of, um, it, I mean, in most hospitals that we work with, they basically had to set up everything from scratch to really, aside from the phone call or the Skype call, even the Skype call to do it in a secure way, et cetera, they, they, they really needed to, uh, yeah, just plan out everything to be able to, to offer the type of virtual care that was really limited to, to a virtual call, essentially. Um, but aside from that, there were no tools um, offered to, to uh, and, and now, yes, some hospitals are reopening, but again, because of second waves, et cetera. But this means that a very large population of people that are affected by neurological conditions have no access to, to care. So they are home, they don't have any access to care, which actually, then increases the problem of comorbidities like cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, um, and, and, and I mean other comorbidities. And the fact of if you, for example, had a stroke already, the risk of a second stroke is present. And if you then are not, for example, are very sedentary and mo not, not moving much, your risk increases in any case. So, um, so yeah, so that this is definitely an, another. Um, extra motivation to make sure that people have access to care. And so, I mean, coming back to our exercise from the beginning, um, obviously when you think about um, when, like our brain is completely connected with our movements, obviously, and our motor skills are driven by what we think and what we, what we um, um, how our brain is, is um, sending signals to our motor skills and, and arms and legs. Um, but for example, if you have a stroke, uh, as, as most of you might know, um, obviously part of your brain gets damaged that might affect then your motor skill because that part of the brain has been damaged. Um, but essentially there's nothing wrong with your arm. So is there a way that we can retrain the brain? So basically a damaged, an, a, a, like a non-damaged part of your brain takes over that damaged part of the brain's function to reinstate mobility. And, um, and that is really where virtuality could come in because you use, can directly engage with objects from a very early start and you use visual stimulation um, while doing movements from a very early start and 
just coming back to, I mean, this is very early stage research for us as well, but there is, um, uh, in 2016, there was a study done by Duke University and a, um, uh, by a Brazilian professor who basically studied spinal injury patients um, who had been paralyzed for a very long time. And they didn't have any function in their legs, but they, um, what he did was essentially put them in an exoskeleton. He put on a VR headset and in the VR headset, they would see legs. Um, so they would basically, and they had a brain um, wave measurement device. So that essentially what, when they were thinking, I'm stepping forward, the exoskeleton would, would move. And also in VR, they would see legs go forward and it would be like they would, when they were looking down, they would actually see themselves walk um, in, in virtual reality. And so they, they did this study for like twice a year, uh, twice, twice every week for a full year. And people with, who had been paralyzed for, for several years, they were actually able to get movement, uh, get sensation in their limbs again. So the, they were not able to walk, obviously, but they were, for example, able to control their bladder. Um, they were able to squeeze their legs, for example, together uh, more closely um, by using this visual stimulation of actually having um, seen themselves walk in virtual reality and also thinking and actually being moved by the exoskeleton um, as such still. But um, so that, that's obviously a very powerful um, uh, result and, and research that, that, was, that was done. And, and physiotherapists also, they use visual stimulation um, quite often. So to give you an example, um, uh, again, spinal injury patient that would be in a harness on top of a treadmill. Um, so that would be paralyzed from the waist down. Um, he, they would be standing up on a treadmill in a harness. And the physiotherapist or the, the therapist would be basically, and a, a mirror would be in front of the patient. So the patient would be here facing the mirror. They would be standing in a harness on a treadmill. And then two therapists would be sitting with their backs to the mirror and they would be moving their legs the legs of the patient essentially at a rhythm that the treadmill will be going. And this is the type of visual stimulation that they're using to show patients. You are actually walking, you can see yourself walk and we're trying to reinstate that neural pathway essentially between your brain and your, your motor skills. Um, and that's, that's essentially what we're, um, obviously aside from making it engaging and obviously increasing compliance by doing the repetitions or the exercises that they should be doing, in a more engaging manner, um, hopefully increase mobility, but potentially also um, uh, have an influence on your on, on the way your brain works and, and learns new things and also restores um, um, functions that have been damaged before because of an injury. So, and then this is an example of how, for example, um, current neurorehabilitation is being done for, for many patients from an upper limb perspective. It, it is very, very basic. It's very simple, and it often frustrates people, a patient. So they, most therapists that we work with, they actually don't use them those tools um, very frequently because they know how how frustrating it is for patients, and they don't really see the point of it. They don't get feedback, so they essentially just ask patients, move your arm twenty times like this, move it twenty times like that, and try to to approach these exercises. Um, differently, as most patients obviously they struggle with lack of strength, fine motor skills, um, and also the, yeah again again don't really see the the motivation behind it. Um, so so that's kind of what we are trying to do with immersive rehab. Uh, this is a Paralympic athlete that we worked with. So he's paralyzed. He was paralyzed from the waist down because of a spinal tumor in his neck. Three times actually he was paralyzed from the waist down, and. Actually, before we met, he was already using visual stimulation on a video basis of himself, running, walking. Um, he was a cyclist. He was a rower as well and um, a skier. So even though he was not able to move his legs, but he was imagining in his hospital bed, I can move my toes, I can move my, my, my legs, etc. And he was walking in um, after eight weeks again. Um, and then his upper limb was affected like a stroke. So he was... Uh, with very limited mobility on one side of his body. Uh, and that's, that's essentially what we worked on together. Um, so so what, what we're aiming to do with, with immersive rehab is really 
what, what, what we have today is essentially immersive rehab is not there. Um, the transfer of patient data between the hospital, in the hospital, the collection of data in the hospital is very much paper-based. In a lot of cases still, it is um, very few data is also being collected. When people go through rehabilitation, it would rather be a very subjective uh, way of assessing um, how a patient has done from one day to the next. So often it's scale-based. So one patient might, one therapist might judge a patient one day, you're five on a scale of 10. Another therapist might say, you're actually a seven on a scale of 10. And that makes it very hard to assess how a patient is actually progressing because it's these scales, they are, they are okay, but they don't give a very objective uh, way of, of um, knowing how a patient is progressing. Also because it's a very point-based assessment. Um, so essentially very few patient data is being collected in the hospital. The transfer of data between when they then get discharged into the home setting is actually hardly existent. So there is not really any exchange uh, or collection of data aside from maybe, again, the scale-based monitoring um, um, of, of how a patient would be doing in, in their home. Um, but that, that really poses a problem for, for various reasons. And uh, for example, when we take the example of MS, um, so MS patients would be diagnosed in a hospital setting or by their neuro neurologist. They would, they would often most likely then be, be just um, treated either in a patient setting or in their home. So they would be in a home setting. And they would see their neurologist potentially every three months, every six months, depending on their condition and how they progress. So because MS, obviously, it, it is a neurodegenerative condition. So people have to um, are on medication from the time they are diagnosed. And that medication is frequently adjust, adjusted because of the way they progress and that their disease progresses. So they, but neurologists really struggle because when they come in, for example, every like let's say they come in every six months, patients are very, they're often very fatigued. They're very, um, they, they are struggling from a mental health perspective. So they don't really have the motivation to track or keep a diary or kind of know how they were feeling from one day to the next. So when they come in for their, let's say 10 to 15 minutes meeting with the neurologist, essentially they have to decide, the neurologist has to decide within this time frame which is already a very stressed conversation then because the neurologist wants to understand how a patient is progressing, how, and within that time frame, they have to decide on the follow-up treatment. Are we going to change the drug, the drug treatment for this patient? Are we going to add additional uh, rehabilitation um, to it? Which one makes it very hard for them to judge? And then also it makes often um, follow-up claims to insurance companies or um, which depending on the country you're in, it depends on um, whether if you're in the US, your claim will, will, will always pass through an insurance company that they will accept the flow of treatment or not. And because of the lack of data, obviously this is very problematic for the patient because if they don't get access to the proper treatment, obviously, or they don't have enough data to, uh, neurologists don't have enough data to actually substantiate certain um, claims, they get rejected, and obviously that's only in the in the very negative outcome for the patient in the end. Um, so, so that's really where we are trying to help as well. Um, but yeah, so, so essentially, um, the aim is to offer um, tools for clinicians and therapists within a clinical setting, and then as soon as they they know how to use it, what inpatient and outpatient clinic, they will then. Um, be transferred into their home and also the technology would be transferred into their home once they've already know how to use it and then all data will be transferred back to the clinician or the therapist that they work with um, to then keep track of how they're progressing essentially. Um, so this is one of our experiences um, where it's essentially based on the grasping method um, this is this is one that we've specifically made for for stroke patients is to train their um, rotational uh, like what I've explained before today often physios they don't use um, objects they just ask to rotational movements left right up and down there's no engagement with objects there's no goal there's no challenge well here actually they're doing all the same movements but we give them a challenge so the aim is to uh, stake blocks and essentially build towers up to certain height 
but there's also coordination uh, exercise behind it because if we, we, we have different difficulties and settings within our uh, program here. Um, so we can, we can change, for example, that we did a focus is on positioning blocks in a correct manner, which is then uh, linked to coordination uh, ability. Otherwise, they will, not, they will not reach the goal, for example. There's the only cognitive aspect here, aside from, from um, the coordination, would be the colors in this case. So that's what's not really. We have other exercises where we actually have um, um, memory memory uh, programs. Um, for example, yeah, this is in a, this is again with the physiotherapist. But um, so where we where we essentially um, train fine motor skills and also at the same time train a memory. So which is in a sense to keep people challenged and engaged. And here as well, so there is a specific time that they have to keep track of to then complete the exercise. And, and it's really incredible to see patients um, that, for example, we I will I will address some case studies later. But like people with severe cognitive deficits um, that basically could not engage for one minute, they actually are in the exercise for ten minutes and longer um, to um, to stay engaged and, and and so on. So that's 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 been really powerful to see. Uh, also increase in mobility uh, range than they would currently be doing in the physical world because of their own limitations that they put on. Um, so, so yeah, so it it is it will be very fascinating to see how, um, yeah, how, like long term studies or long term studies in a couple of years how basically um, outcomes will have been uh, for for patients um, in the long term when they're using our our systems. So, so yeah, I mean, as I mentioned before, so obviously the telehealth aspect, it, it is an important part of, of our solution as well, uh, both, both in a clinical setting even, where, where, where we give access to um, a more comprehensive platform for clinicians um, to use and, 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 and the therapists working in, in the facility, in, in the hospital, um, but also obviously when moving into a community setting and in a home setting, so that a therapist can always tune in, um, or a neurologist can tune in when people are doing exercises or, or um, personalized exercises for the patients. Uh, um, they will always have the upper hand. So essentially, um, the there will be an initial setting set for patients to do exercises, but clinicians and therapists will always have the upper hand to change and to to tune in when they need to. Um, but this obviously will be um, um, yeah, a great resource of data for the clinical staff um, to be able to really assess patients in a more, um, in an enhanced manner, really, where um, currently they are lacking, they're lacking that data to make the most informed decision about the clinical outcomes for the patients. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's, really, um, that's really our goal. And I mean, coming back to Obviously, yeah, COVID-19 is obviously a big issue. And as Beatrice also mentioned before, um, rolling out headsets, et cetera, is, is, is still, it's, it's not straightforward yet. But uh, going forward in the future, um, th this will become a lot more um, straightforward when it becomes a lot more widespread and um, more accessible, like a mobile phone, really, where people can access it very easily and also through the hospital. Um, there's a lot more hospitals as well are doing studies of their own. They're seeing really the value of virtual reality in healthcare. They have done um, like long-term studies like um, uh, hospitals in Los Angeles, for example, um, and some hospitals in, in, uh, in, in Belgium and the Netherlands as well. They, um, that, that, that have shown, for example, incredible results for pain management uh, using it for anesthesia. Uh, instead of anesthesia, essentially um, during during surgery or during certain, um, uh, for example, pregnancy, uh, uh, like the deliveries of babies, etc. So, uh, but also in terms of much more severe um, um, pain management um, assessments and and and, and treatments. Um, so, so, so yeah, it it is, is very promising. Um, uh, but still lots of obviously uh, there's there's still lots of issues that in telehealth or telemedicine in general um, 
that need to be figured out. Um, and this is independent of virtual reality, just even the normal, um, even video calls, or um, there's, there's still lots of um, infrastructure issues in terms of when a person is living, as I said before, if, if, you're living, if you live a bit more remotely where the coverage of um, bandwidth is not, um, is, is just not sufficient enough to actually run um, software from a, from a cloud system or to make like a real time connection with, um, with someone um, that is, that is some, some kilometers from, from you, uh, let's say hospital 50 kilometers away, uh, but you live in a very remote setting, then essentially you will not have access to digital health or, or, or uh, remote care. Um, and, and that I think is something that it will definitely improve going forward and 5G, the rollout of 5G will definitely help there as well because it will really increase um, the, um, essentially the way data is being transferred in a real time manner will be a much more reliable than it is today. Um, also the streaming, for example, of content and VR content in particular from a cloud based system will just be um, much, much better and, and the latency will be very low. So that they're, they're, in that sense, it will be, um, it will open up a lot of opportunities. And, but then again, this, come, this still needs to then obviously be implemented across regions because if you just focus on cities, obviously that means that cities will definitely have access to digital care, a remote care, but anybody else that doesn't live in a city and that doesn't have really proper access to bandwidth, essentially they don't have access to digital care. And I don't think that's the, the aim of digital health in general or um, remote care using digital solutions is that you can, you can give access to people uh, to healthcare, to, you can give access to healthcare to people by using these digital health solution. And that's for me really the aim is, is to ensure that everybody has access to healthcare and not just, uh, uh, and I think that's again, where a lot of, uh, different stakeholders need to come together to really roll it out as the value, especially during COVID, has been shown of, of just telehealth in general, because there was no other option. It was the only option for, for doctors and clinicians to go to, and also for patients to see their doctor. It was the only option in a lot of cases to actually use an app or use Skype or Zoom to actually see your doctor or see your therapist. Um, so, so this force of the implementation has obviously shown that there's still a lot of issues around implementation. Um, but, but, but yeah, it is definitely, uh, the, the, I guess it's here to say that it's definite, but um, yeah, still, still issues need to be figured out to ensure a widespread adoption and a widespread access for everyone to, to these digital healthcare solutions. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, just, just, I guess coming back to what we focus on in particular is the precisation aspect of this is really important of the, um, our programs, our virtual reality programs, or our neurorehabilitation programs is the fact because every patient's condition is different. So what, what it often is, is the approach today is that it, because one, there's not enough clinical staff, there's not enough time to, um, to um, give to patients. For them to actually, um, to actually completely um, uh, follow follow program or to get or to get um, personalized care. I mean, um, so so what 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 clinicians and therapists could give these patients is really um, um, kind of more a, a one size fits all um, therapy because they just don't have the tools, they don't have the the means, so they they need to. Um, they do the best with what they can, with, with, with what they have. So they give most patients kind of a more um, one size fits all approach to, well, you need to do these exercises. And within this time frame that we have, which is a few weeks, depending on maybe three weeks, depending on where you are in the world, up to eight weeks. And then within this time frame, we just need to make sure that you kind of progress in some way or the other. Um, and that's obviously problematic because yeah, it doesn't make sense if you have two people with us with the same condition, like a stroke, for example, but one person progresses quicker than the other, that they would still be following the same uh, program. Uh, it's, that's why the personalization really is important and also to make sure that they have the best possible access to care that they, that they um, need. Um, so, um, 
So yeah, so, so, so that's really key. And obviously that comes, it's very closely linked to the objective and, and how we patient assessments, I guess, because if we can make it more personalized, that means that obviously the, the, the data that we get from these exercises will be a lot more relevant to the specific patient as well, rather than if you have a, if you have a one size fits all program, you just give it to the patient because you don't, and I, I yeah, maybe just, just taking one step, all therapists and, and clinicians that we work with, they, they are incredible, um, but it's just the tools that they don't have. So, so in that sense, it's really helping them uh, with, with just having access to more data and then health data so they, so they can help patients better within the time that they have. Um, so uh, another aspect of ECE is, is predictive analytics that um, that is definitely something we're still working on, but yeah, you could, expect by monitoring a patient much more regularly um, than currently is the case that you could potentially flag up um, second incidences um, just by 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 certain changes in movement or that isn't that are not linked to fatigue for example or um, or, or just other sickness um, so, so that, that's something that could help with decision support as well for the the therapist um, and then obviously the remote care aspect, as I mentioned before. So okay. Um, so so yeah, just just coming back to our case studies. Um, so we've done trials so far, uh, but we're still doing more trials to um, to just um, learn more and 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 assure uh, full effectiveness, like on a long term basis, to see what what um, to see how how the